Hello, I'm uh, John Gribben from the Barts Cancer Institute in London. We are at the 12th International Workshop in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I'm joined by Wolfram Brugger and uh, Myron uh, Tuchman. Uh, we're here to discuss uh, an issue that's becoming increasingly important for our patients. This notion of uh, chemo-free or the fact that more targeted therapies look like the, the way uh, forward. Well, we've just had a very spirited discussion uh, um, uh, among the, the participants at the workshop about the whole notion of how we how we define it. Um, you know, and we, we heard different kind of interpretations. How so? Uh, when your patients come to talk to you about getting conventional chemotherapy versus thinking about some of these newer agents, do, do you feel that the patients appreciate the differences of what we're talking about here, of what we mean by these kind of more modern, more targeted therapies working in a very different way? Uh, not completely. I think the patients uh, always think that they get some kind of chemotherapy, some kind of chemicals. And even if, a, if they get an antibody, they think that's a chemotherapeutic drug. So they don't really uh, get the difference between real cytotoxic drugs and m more new drugs. Sure. Now, maybe it's a little bit of a difference between the European approach and sometimes the patients, but I, I get the sense that in the US, the kind of a notion of a chemo-free approach is something that's gathering a lot more traction and a lot more attention from patient groups and advocates. Is, is that your impression of your clinical practice, Myron? Yeah, John, actually, uh, not only in the practice, but also when we meet uh, and we have, uh, for example, patient advocates from different groups, it's their perception that they're very excited at about a non-standard chemotherapy arm, for example, a combination of antibodies or one of the new targeted agents with an antibody in their impression, hey, I like it because it's chemo-free. And what we discussed, and you pointed out very clearly, that a number of these targeted agents, although may not have the same degree of non-specific toxicity, they still have, most of them have toxicities, which we have to then gauge how much we give, dose the schedule. We have to modify the doses, dropping them, sometimes even stopping them to, to uh, excessive toxicity. So it's true that in the States, our patients go on chat lines and they have this different perspective than maybe the European patients. Uh, I don't know about in what you see in, in London, but our patients do come to us saying, no, I want this therapy. And then you have to explain to them, by the way, do you know the side effects associated with these things? Sure. Yeah, I mean, my, my perception is the same. Uh, patients come more and more having gone onto the internet, knowing about the new drugs, finding that from what they read about it, the side effect profile looks very different than conventional chemotherapy. And of course, the big one is you know, loss of hair um, as, a, as, a, as a, an indication of, of, of what's happening. Um, I guess one of the things that was coming out of the discussion we we're just having is that, of course, what we all want for our patients are more effective, more targeted therapy with fewer side effects. What I think many of us are cautious about is trying to advocate to people that it's an, it's an either or, you should either have conventional chemotherapy or you should have more targeted therapies, when in fact that might be that we're right on the cusp of being able to move away for conventional chemotherapy for some diseases, but for others, we still don't know whether the right way to use these new agents is in combination with chemotherapy. Now, you've done a lot of work with, uh, with vendamustine um, uh, through your, your study group, and kind of it's the drug that came out of Germany to the rest of the world for us right. to, to see it. It's interesting, of course, that very many of these new agents are also being combined with uh, bendamustine and, and rituximab. So if you like a little bit of the old and the new together, um, what do you think of, of the, the use of combinations of, of old, you know, old drugs with targeted therapies? I think that's a good approach to combine these new drugs with BR, for instance, bendamustine rituximab. It's a well-known uh, chemotherapeutic immunotherapeutic approach. It's very effective, it's not that toxic, and you can, buy, can combine these, uh, this combination with uh, the new drugs. And we certainly are eagerly uh, awaiting the results of the ongoing phase three trials in that respect to really see if you add something uh, to the current approach with BR, for instance, in indolent lymphomas. Now, it's an interesting concept. Well, we've got several clinical trials now where we've got for slightly younger, patient, fitter patients. We use conventional chemotherapy like bendamustine plus, say, idolilizib rituximab. But for an elder, more elderly patient, we'd use uh, rituximab uh, alone. Do you feel that we're in the era can still where age alone should be the factor that determines whether patients have treatment A or treatment B? 
It actually is probably it's changing in front of us, John, with respect. If we have effective therapies and uh, less toxic, they could be open for both older and younger patients. Your point's well made that uh, we had a discussion even yesterday with respect to how do you, if the individual had large cell, how to treat the individual, and it was uh, not one answer, multiple answers, including also very aggressive therapy if I was 30 years younger. So you're correct, I mean, it's really aggressive approach. I still think, in my mind, is still like, um, I was, uh, when I, through training and through my career, uh, we had a lot of physicians before the targeted therapies that believed in high dose therapy is good, higher dose therapy is better. And every patient deserves to have very high dose therapy and a potential chance in an auto transplant before they die. That's not the approach that I think we have come to today. I think the whole idea, in fact, the evolution that we've seen with, you know, first the non myeloablative type of approach with allogeneic stem cell transplant, and the discussions that we've had today, the exciting preliminary data on the CAR T cells, taking T cells, educating them, and putting them back in the patients is so exciting that we might not have a, a minimum or maximum age for some of these therapies in the near future. I do find it intriguing, however, that, um, that many of the studies that do still talk about using conventional chemotherapy plus some targeted therapies are, are using quite often bendamustine as a backbone, yeah. a, a drug which I've often felt is actually very well tolerated in, in, in older patients anyway. So it strikes me as a little bit of an artificial, uh, an artificial divide. Um, so what advice would you give to patients that do come to you who, who's saying, I want the chemo Free approach. What, what, what's your approach to, to handling those patients? So, sounds like, sounds yeah. like in Germany those patients aren't coming so often yet. They are coming more uh, often actually, but currently we don't have this possibility to treat these patients more or less chemo free because the drugs are not approved yet. So uh, at least in first line we have to await the uh, randomized trials and then we will see what we can do. In the meantime, I still think that we have to use uh, some kind of chemotherapy in combination with rituximab for indolent lymphomas and similarly for aggressive lymphomas. So right now it's only on clinical trials. The drugs are not approved yet, at least not in the, in the first line treatment and we can use them only in real life patients. It's also, I mean, you raise an interesting issue there about the fact that they're available in clinical trials. I mean, one of the things that's been exciting about these new agents is how rapidly those clinical trials uh, enroll. So, it, but of course, for those patients that want access to these agents, a very good way to do so continues to be to being committed to wanting to take part in clinical trials. Have you found that that's increased um, patients' willingness and, and eagerness to take part in clinical trials? Yes, John, because sometimes actually these uh, patients accrue so quickly, by the time you get the trial approved, there's not many spots left to actually put patients on. But I think I wanted to comment also in addition to what Lohram was saying was that there also this idea that, oh yeah, I don't want to have toxicity, but also the issue of being on a monotherapy on an agent, a single agent indefinitely to progression is so expensive. And also I don't, from what we've seen in the last two days, Maybe by combining agents, we have a, not only a faster response, but a less of a chance of developing resistance to, say, just one drug. So I, I think that when a patient comes, I just want to answer the same question you asked Dr. Brugger, is that when a patient comes to tell me, well, I want this treatment, it's my responsibility to tell them why I think it's a reasonable choice or why, you know what, based on the data, you're much better off getting the standard chemo beta mustine or toxin approach as your initial therapy because we don't have enough information with your specific type of you know, lymphoma or CLL to treat you differently. Even though they want it, I think that's part of our job. And it's taking longer now because the patients come in with the articles and with off the, you know, from the internet telling us what they want, but it takes our, it's our responsibility to actually educate them. Sure. I mean, I think it's our responsibility to work with our patients sure. to say what we're looking for is to find the right therapy that's the most appropriate for your stage of disease yes. based upon where your disease is now and what you've had in the past. And, and I think what I'd like to say that we came got out of that discussion and that debate today was that what we're excited by is that we do have targeted agents available now. There, some of them now approved. It adds to the agents and the armamentarium that we have to go to go against cancer, but that perhaps now isn't the time yet to be thinking of a dichotomy between chemo-free and 
and, and chemotherapy, but we're in, in an era where we've got additional agents in to continue our fight against cancer. That's a good point. So uh, I think uh, we can wrap up then by saying what we've heard uh, over the last few days is a lot of work based upon these more targeted therapies being based upon our understanding of the biology of the disease. We're very excited that we've got new agents available that are now approved uh, and in use, that we have to think about that it's not the time to throw out everything we have in the past and move on to something new. It's about using in addition to what we already have, these new agents with it and finding the right combination for our patients uh, and, and that's what we'd all like to see going forward.